Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I'm going to be reviewing Flashpoint South China Sea, designed by Harold Buchanan and polished by GMT Games. So here is Flashpoint South China Sea. It's all set up for solo play. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what the game's about, and then just a very quick description of what happens during the turns. So Flashpoint South China Sea is a game that is meant to represent the United States and China's war for influence over this area of the world, over the South China Sea. And essentially what that's going to mean is that both sides are placing cubes in these different areas and you can place economic or diplomatic influence in various countries. And when you feel like you have enough influence, if you have the right card, you can try to score um, one of these scoring cards and they can be scored once per campaign. So during each campaign, there's one, two, three campaigns in the game. And that's essentially just rounds of playing cards. You are going to try to score as much as possible. And then all the cards are gonna be scored one more time after campaign number three. So make sure that you're in a good condition at that point. There's a tension track up here that kind of represents how the actions that we're taking around the South China Sea impact the relationship between China and the United States. And it makes some actions more expensive, especially for China. So messing around with the tension track is a key part of the game. And then of course you've got your little reserve of cubes. I'm playing the United States in this setup, so I have some in my reserve, but the AI player has nothing in reserve and is just ready to go. Down here is the victory point track that represents whether we're winning or not. And because it's a little bit easier to play China, the United States starts with a couple of extra victory points is basically what it boils down to. There's a more nuanced conversation to be had about that, I think. But you're trying to pull influence in your direction as much as possible. If you ever hit 15 points, it's an instant win over the other player. So we're having a big tug of war across the South China Sea in order to see which world power is going to have the most say over what happens in this part of the world. This is a card-driven game. It's got a lot in common with Twilight Struggle. So during your turns, you are going to be playing these different cards that have different attributes. So I got a lot of American events this time. I guess that's good, but we'll talk about that. But each of these cards has a few different things to note about them. Um, you can play them for their ops points and the ops points vary in value from one to three. There are suits on them that you can use to match things in the discard pile, which we'll talk about briefly. You can play them for their event, or at least you can if the event is a United States event for me or a China event for the Chinese player. They're also, event cards that have a black bar, and that means that either side can play them. And your other option is to play for scoring. So whatever flag is in the bottom left of your card, you can play that card and then score that scoring card. So you have to be careful. If you think you're going to gain primacy in Vietnam, for example, you don't want to waste that by then playing your Vietnamese scoring card to do it, because then you can get more cubes there, but you can't uh, score. Oops. So in a solo version of this game, you are playing very normally as yourself. And then there's a very simple little flow chart for what the solo bot's gonna do. So the solo opponent doesn't actually draw any cards, but they are gonna go through a series of steps involving these two decks of cards, the solo cards, and then also just the regular event cards that everybody plays with. So the first thing a solo player is always gonna do is draw the top card of the event deck. And then they're gonna see if they can score the area that comes up. So in this case, we have Brunei, um, can they score it? No, because we're actually in control over here right now by a little bit, but still. So they're not going to try to score Brunei. So they're going to move on to the next step in their little flowchart. If they'd scored, then they would end the turn immediately, but they didn't. Then you're going to turn the top card of the solo deck face up, and you're going to check for what's called mode match. So that's not what's showing up here. But mode match is basically once you started to play events and you're putting your events in the discard pile, don't forget, some of my events I can play, and then some of the events I can't because they're my opponent's events. Meanwhile, my opponent is going to draw some United States events that I can't play because they didn't come in my hand. However, if there's a mode match, things might be different. So if I have a Chinese economic event up here at the top of the discard pile that I played, then the Chinese player can attempt to do a mode match with this symbol in order to get access to this card that they never drew themselves. So you just turn over the top card on the deck. Nothing too crazy is going on there. So there's no mode match here, not for them. If the opponent only has one operations value, then they're gonna adjust tension, which is up here at the top of the board. The Chinese especially want tension to go down because it makes it cheaper for them to place cubes. So watch out for that. But these guys have two ops points right now. Um, so that's not going to come into play. But what is gonna happen this time is that there's gonna be political warfare 
uh, because that's what's on at the top of this card. So basically political warfare is what happens when you place cubes in your political warfare tracks. Then you draw another card off of the deck. And if its ops value is equal to or less than the cubes that you've put down, then you're successful with political warfare. So that increases tension, which has consequences on other aspects of gameplay, but it also lets you dump somebody else's cubes out of a country and lock it. So if we got to play political warfare on the Philippines, we could toss all of China's cubes here and then lock them out for the duration of the campaign, which is pretty wild. And then if that doesn't work, then they're gonna use their card to perform operations, which basically means putting out cubes, and competing with us for all this delicious space across the South China Sea. Of course, on our turn, we don't have to use the full chart at all because we get to look at our cards and just decide, okay, which one of these do I wanna play? And do I wanna play it to score? Do I wanna play it for the ops points? Do I wanna play it for the event? Or do I have a mode match going on with the discard pile? So for example, uh, I'm ahead in Brunei right now. And what I might do with that is try to score it. Because if you look at the Brunei scoring card, it says, compare all cubes in Brunei, decide what the positive differential scores it as VPs, not exceeding one. So I can only ever get one VP here. And I'm also the only one with a cube in this part of the world. So if I want to, I can play this card for scoring. I can flip this card over to indicate that it's been scored this campaign. I move my victory track one. And as one of the bonuses in the card, I can move on, I can move one of my reserve cards to available. And then it will be time for the bot to go again. And we're going to keep going until I run out of cards. And that's going to mean that the campaign is over. Then we'll reset and do it a couple more times to see who ultimately holds sway in the South China Sea. So I try to keep this explanation short, but hopefully it gives you a good sense of what's going on in the game. It is a nasty little tug of war where you are placing cubes, forcing people to discard cubes, messing around with tension in the region, and trying to score cards at opportune moments in order to take out your opponent. Uh, the only thing that we didn't talk about are these little island chains in the middle. So basically for scoring, these are usually counted as part of the country that they are attached to with a line. But these are phonop and CR spots, and they are in these little island chains in the South China Sea. One thing that's really interesting is that phonops are always pretty cheap for the United States to place, but they get removed at the end of the campaign. It costs China a bit more, especially if the tension track is high, to place CR cubes here in the middle of the ocean. However, these remain from turn to turn as an example of, as a way to represent China's continuing proximity to this area. So the United States has other interests elsewhere in the world, but China is always here. So the investment in CR cubes can actually be very good for the Chinese player, even if they're expensive sometimes. And that is the essence of how this game works. Get your influence out there, kick other influence out, score these cards at the right moment, take advantage of any mode matches if somebody plays an event that you wanted but it wasn't in your hand, and see how well you can do across the course of three campaigns. So that's an overview of the game. Let's go ahead and have some final thoughts. All right, so now for some final thoughts. I have very mixed feelings about this game, and I'm going to explain why. On the one hand, mechanically, I think this game is absolutely gorgeous. It flows so beautifully. It's very smooth. It's super easy to learn. The solo bot is very easy to run. I can see this being a really intense two-player experience as well. And I just really have no complaints about the cleverness of the card play or the challenge of getting your cubes in there or the possibility of locking people out of various countries or even like the scorecard structure where you have to make decisions about when the time is correct to try to get a scorecard. All those things are really cool and there's just so much thought that went into making a relatively simple system have a very pleasing thinkiness to it and i for that reason would really like to see some more flashpoint games there was a lot to like in this game system i also thought that the rule book was super clear it was very easy to understand what to do in this game i liked the board and the components everything just looked really clean everything was very smooth everything was very nicely organized and you know really this is one of those games where I don't have anything to complain about, except that I do. And <laughs> that's that's what's so challenging about this one. So it's, it's about ostensibly a super dramatic issue that's going on in our world right now. Like the prospect of the United States and China going to war is terrifying. You know, there are cards in that deck that represent current events that are really serious. There's a Vladimir Putin card in there, and we know how much havoc that dude has caused in the past year on a global scale. And yet, nothing ever really seems to rock the boat that hard in the South China Sea. Everything is so sleek, everything is so smooth, that 
it's almost like all the gritty, dramatic, emotional aspects of the game that could exist are smoothed away. Like it's all sanded down to an incredible smoothness that while it is impressive and it works beautifully and it's nice to look at, also makes it less of a memorable and intense gameplay experience. Um, It's kind of like, I guess it's like a Hallmark movie where I watch Hallmark movies and I enjoy them, but then I can't actually remember what the actors look like. And then next year I won't remember whether I watched a specific Hallmark movie or not because they all kind of run together in my memory and I don't have strong feelings about or memories of any particular one. And I think that in a game that's about global politics and especially a very live wire global issue, that that is a problem. So I would like to see another Flashpoint game but I would really like to see one, you know, this is called the first in a series, which is why I keep bringing this up. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I want to see these really beautiful and well thought out mechanics. Again, I like them, but I also want to see them applied in a way that has real fear and tension and just something more in that's going to kind of hook me and grip me and keep me in there and kind of like make it hurt good. Cause I feel like that's what a good political or historical game ought to do. So Flashpoint South Carolina Sea is a good start to a series. I think, you know, the the mechanisms are great. The rule book is great. The graphic design is clean. You know, on the surface of it, everything is great. It's just that it's too much surface and not enough depth. That said, I think there are people who really enjoy this two player. I don't intend to keep this one in my solo collection just because it's not compelling enough to keep me pulling it off the shelf again and again, but I would definitely try another Flashpoint game. And I certainly have a lot of respect for the design as it currently stands. So that's where I'm at on Flashpoint. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, support me on Patreon if you are feeling generous. And most of all, happy gaming.